Uh, or if you just want to catch up and, and see what's in store for Whispers of the Old Gods, you can head to oldgods.com for all your information regarding the newest Hearthstone expansion. Uh, but now we've talked about all the fun stuff that has happened over the course of the weekend. Now it's time to get down to that nitty gritty. It's time to start setting up this grand final. Uh, let's take a look at the first finalist. It, it's uh, Amnesiac. So uh, over the course of the weekend, we've seen uh, his bold deck choices really come out in his favor. He brought Murloc Paladin, he brought Rogue, he brought a new type of control warrior with Gorhal. So Reynad, just generally, uh, how did you feel about this lineup and, and sort of it, its strengths and how it got him to the finals? Uh, it's, it's been performing very well for him, very strong lineup, uh, good against something like Freeze Mage, for example. He got got the the Druid, the, the Warrior. I mean, it's just decks that are all around strong, and then this Murloc strategy is kind of the offbeat deck. And I mean, that, that's a deck with such polarizing matchups that as long as you queue it into one of the decks that you're favored against, you're very, very likely to win. So, And there were some players thinking, Cora, that uh, maybe he brought the Murloc Paladin to sort of draw out a ban in some of the control matchups to make way for the Druid. Is this a strategy that's that's popular, is trying to make it so you can play Druid as much as possible? I wouldn't say it's a popular strategy, but I would say it's absolutely an amnesiac thing to do. He's a very intelligent kid, and knowing that that Murloc Paladin, likely going to be the only Murloc Paladin in the tournament, uh, he would bring it, surprise the first opponent, and he got the win against the Control Warrior with the first Murloc Paladin, and since then, we haven't seen it played. So I think drawing out the ban with the Paladin, a really, start, a really smart strategy, and uh, that Druid has been able to pull a win for him in the rest of his matches. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty formidable deck, and a lot of players don't have much experience playing against it. So it's, it's not something that players are comfortable with. So they banned it out, and then they're forced to play against a Druid. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, some of the highlights from Amnesiac's run to get to the finals. We have uh, this first replay, which is from, uh, I believe, day one, where Amnesiac's showing off this control warrior and going into a tough matchup uh, that is this, uh, this slow control warlock. He get uh, sorry, this is a Saturday clip. He... He gets a huge Harrison Jones off, which allows him to make a creative play to set up lethal. So, uh, Raynad, was this Warrior deck one of the keys to success for Amnesiac? Yeah, it's been one of the better performing decks uh, across the entire tournament for almost everybody. It's been doing very, very well. It's had a 10 and 7 record so far. Uh, just, just very consistent, kind of has game against everything because it is just a pile of removal. So, you know, most decks play minions. You kill stuff, you hope that you draw the right answers to the threats, and, you know, when it works out, the deck takes very commanding victories. And, Cora, we've seen uh, not as much Patron Warrior as we were probably expecting. In the finals, is actually two Control Warrior players, Amnesia being one of them. What, why do you think we saw more Control Warrior as opposed to Patron Warrior over the course of the weekend? It was just a really good meta read. A lot of people coming in thought that Patron Warrior would be the more prevalent Warrior deck. Uh, really counters the Druids, counters the Paladins, but in fact, the Patron Warrior really underperforming this weekend. Snail having some trouble with it, and uh, it, it, it just didn't perform the way that we thought it would. Control Warrior, however, making up five of the seven Warrior decks in the tournament and really showing that it is one of the stronger decks in the meta right now. So definitely just a meta read, maybe preparing a lot for Freeze Mage, and I think it worked out really well. I know, Raynad, you've been playing an interesting <laughs> Patron Warrior deck on your stream over the past couple of weeks. Is it just because people haven't caught on to your innovative Patron techs that you, <laughs> that you so much love that Patron Warrior is not as, as popular? Uh, well, the, the Hobgoblin list that I've been streaming with isn't exactly typostrom.com approved yet. Um, I'm getting there. I'm working on it. It's a very fun deck to play, very synergy-based, but... You know, you want to play more entertaining stuff on stream. I definitely think, like, the versions that Chess Dude and Snail Bra were a little bit more standard and performed, like, reasonably well. Like, I think there were solid ways to build it. So your Patron Warrior deck hasn't put on its space shorts yet, so to speak. Promo code TEMPO for 20% <laughs> off your win rate with your Patron Warrior deck. That's exactly what it is. All right, let's head into the second replay of Amnesiac. Uh, this one isn't really him, but it's just to, to showcase this Control Warrior deck once again. Um, Talion, in this clip... Uh, had to expend so many resources as the Temple Mage in order to uh, take out this Death Lord, which is an inclusion that's been somewhat recent as far as Control Warrior tech choices go. So, Cora, why, what's, what does this Death Lord accomplish in the current Control Warrior, and, and why is this such a popular card now uh, after not seeing it for a while in this type of list? 
The Death Lord really just fits very well in this type of warrior. Double bash, double shield slam, double execute, uh, all the weapons, gore howl, double brawl. This warrior is the most efficient removal deck in the game right now. So to use the Death Lords, sets up a wall, gives you a lot of time to gather those cards, and then you don't really have to worry about your opponent having minions on their board because you're just so capable of removing them in the first place. So it's, it's not as much of a detriment as it would be in, say, a deck like Druid that has a really hard time dealing with minion removal. Yeah, and Raynad, you, you talked before uh, on the desk about how uh, Amnesiac with his warrior tends to make these cute plays that don't necessarily fit too much. What does Amnesiac have to do going into the finals uh, to take a win with this warrior deck should it not be banned? I mean, he just has to play solid. Like I said, in most of the games he's played the deck, he's played fine. There, there were a couple games where, like, he did mess up, and he admittedly so by him afterwards. As long as he recognizes that, just... You know, plays a solid game afterwards, just relaxes, even though it is finals, try not to get too stressed out about it. He'll perform fine. He's been playing very well at tournament. All right, well, uh, another deck that uh, Amnesiac brought that was sort of, uh, I guess we can just straight up go ahead and say it, a rogue deck in the tournament, and that's Rogue. <laughs> so uh, only two players to bring it, and they both made it to the semifinals. So let's take a look at another clip from actually earlier today where Amnesiac went for uh, a play here. Um, with the, the Lotheb and the, uh, the oil here. So, Randon, why don't you walk me through this one? Well, uh, the turn before this, Amnesiac made the correct choice to get Millhouse out of Piloted Shredder. He's following that up with some, you know, just Lotheb to really lock the board yeah. down while he has a board lead. Oil to, to just put on a ton of pressure without being too vulnerable to AoE and... Yeah, just managed to close the game out. Yeah, so he, he used the load that that turn because he knew that he would have a really good chance uh, next turn to close out the game. So wh why do you think Oil Rogue, the Korra, has been so successful over the course of this weekend? It's a deck that not many people have been considering very strong. Is it just sort of a person-by-person -person basis? Is our Rogue players really right in being confident in all their matchups? I think rogue players have a good point. The rogue players that are passionate about rogue are generally the ones who play rogue the best. So naturally, when you play more rogue, when you have a lot of experience, you're going to play it better, and you're likely going to play it better than your opponent. So Chess Dude and Amnesiac being the two players that brought the rogue both had very similar rogue styles today, very aggressive rogue play, definitely knowing when they needed to go all in and really push for those victories and look for those outs. So I think it was a combination of that experience and that aggressive rogue play that really helped them pull out those victories. Yeah, and Rogue actually did really well over the course of the weekend. Did, ha did have a positive win-loss record overall in the tournament. So the two players that brought it made it to the semifinalists and did super well with it. Uh, but that's enough for Amnesiac. Let's head over and look at the second finalist for the America's Winter Championship. There's Nostum. Good old Wacky Bob, as a lot of people <laughs> uh, like to call him. But he had a, a, a pretty solid lineup overall. Uh, Raynad. Um, you saw Chalky's Aggro Shaman, and she, you had some words about that, but Nasim's Aggro Shaman was a little bit different. It was a lot more minion heavy with Arcane Golems. What, what are your thoughts on, on, his, on his Aggro Shaman? In this Honestly, lineup? Nasim's Aggro Shaman is really weird, too. Both of them are just not <laughs> standard list. Nasim searched for every charge minion in the game, fit as many of them as he could into his Shaman deck, and attacked face a lot. That's a very strong linear strategy. It's going to work well if you get the right matchups. It performed great for him, so... Uh, yeah, you know, whatever works, props to him. I definitely think that it's impossible to build, like, a bad Shaman aggro deck, although I do my best to try on stream. Uh, like, almost <laughs> any combination of Overload and Burn, like, will be reasonable. So, yeah, deck worked out great for him, and definitely can't fault him for bringing what he's comfortable with. Yeah, and uh, we can take a look at the, the first clip here from uh, day one, actually, to showcase exactly the strength of the Shaman. Cora, I need your expert analysis on this game. Is that a good starting hand for Nostum? TJ, let me give it to you straight. It is a fantastic hand, and I think maybe Chalky Sphere, the number two, those two uh, tunnel trogs coming into Nostum's hand had something to do with it, but that's, I mean, that's this is literally the perfect hand. This is the hand you want to draw. Even coming down to the coin, he has Totem Golem on turn two, Arcane Golem on turn three if he wants it. I mean, that's that's literally just the draw. Yeah, and uh, the Tunnel Trog really being one of the key cards in that one. And it, it sort of cut off the clip, but Nasim actually 
uh, looked over his monitor at at Chalky in that matchup <laughs> after he played after he coined out the second tunnel chalk. He gave a little look, and Nassim's one of those guys who deadpans mm -hmm. most of the game because he's just so focused and usually pretty nervous. So uh, I, it was really funny and to see that kind of thing. And uh, let's take a look at another Shaman game. Shaman was one of the sort of key decks for Nassim throughout the entire tournament. So uh, this was another play. And Raynad, you actually disagreed with this initially. Uh, do you keep the same opinion on this play? Yeah, Nassim uh, definitely messed up this turn. He, he got the game into a position where he's very favored. He's got Warlock Hero Power, Doom Hammer. Like, he's going to draw enough damage to win the game, but he doesn't kill the, the Dr. Boom, and that allows Chesty to have enough damage on board to race him. Yeah, and he did draw the Sludge Belcher the following turn, so uh, he did win that matchup. Um, but th again, this is just a showcase what a key deck this was for Nossum throughout the entire weekend. So uh, looking at his matchup against Amnesiac, uh, is he going to be able to find a win with that Shaman with Amnesiac having, you know, uh, some of those more control type decks, Cora? Yeah, I think so. The Shaman, it's it's a little bit of a unique build. We haven't seen Ancestral Knowledge. We didn't see Earthshock. Um, but those charred minions, like Rain Ed said, always a pretty good strategy if you want to deal yeah. damage to the face. So maybe might struggle a little bit against uh, the Control, uh, control Warrior. Warrior and... Uh, might not even be too great against the rogue because the remote the rogue has such efficient removal mm -hmm. but i think if you're going to find a win with anything much like druid aggro shaman is very very consistent and every once in a while you just get that crazy opening hand yeah a lot of players have been telling me that aggro shaman is one of the strongest cards in the game and judging by your comments earlier rain saying that just put a bunch of overload a <laughs> bunch of charge min minions in the deck it's going to do pretty well uh, so let's take a look at the final replay that we have here from Nasim. This is just his winning moment, and um, it, it, it was a, a lethal spot. And it was a little bit of a tougher one, but he had plenty of ways to kill off his, his own minions. So uh, this Reno lock, quite a bit different from Sky High, who did lose in the semifinals. What do you think of, of Nostum's Reno Warlock deck, Raynad, as opposed to the ones that are more grindy? He does run the win condition with the Arcane Golem. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's definitely a different way of, of ending the game to, to play that kind of win condition with the, the charge minions, but uh, the tech choices really are what are paying off for Nostum there. You know, Kazan Mystic did win him that Freeze Mage game. That could have gone, you know, towards Chess Dude if he didn't have access to that card to just end it right there, so. Yeah, and we, we talked a little bit on the caster desk about how the, the Chinese players and the Chinese-American players tend to tech their decks out a little bit more and don't have room for the win conditions. Uh, the Kazan Mystic ended up being a risky choice for this tournament because we saw a lot of other players throughout the weekend really struggle to find room for those tech cards. Uh, but Nasim actually won a very close series mm -hmm. because of it. Uh, Cora, t talk to me about that Reno lock and how you, you balance fitting in tech cards and trying to find win conditions. Do you think those tech cards are worth it in the end to try and beat, you know, specific matchups like Freeze Mage and like Zoo with Mind Control tech or things like that? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, WTY Bill and All Sky High, who also had that Kazan Mystic in their decks, maybe were anticipating more Freeze Mage and just unfortunately didn't run up against it. Uh, Nostum got a very good matchup. He had that Kazan Mystic all teched out. That had to be for the Freeze Mage mirror, yeah. or for the Freeze Mage matchup. And then that Mind Control tech, we surprisingly didn't see a lot of Zoo this weekend. We saw some Demon Handlock, we saw some Reno, and a lot of Warlock bands. So the Mind Control tech didn't come in quite as handy as that Kazan Mystic. And even the rest of the Kazan Mystics in the tournament didn't show their full strength. But in this case, Nostum got a great matchup, and his tech choices really showed through. Yeah, Reno... Warlock is sort of like a toolkit, and you put put what tools you need in it or what you think you need. You only have room for a certain amount, and this tournament, I think there was a lot of dead ones, uh, but it ended up paying off. Uh, Raynad, this is sort of a, a weird question. What do you think is the the, the future of Reno Lock? Because Reno Jax is not going anywhere with Standard. Um, what do you think the future looks like for a deck like Reno Lock, which is just like sort of like this crazy toolkit? Yeah, I mean, it's a deck that's just going to constantly adapt with the metagame. There's going to be new Warlock tools that come out. There's going to be old Warlock tools that we're used to having that, you know, just rotate out. And uh, the deck will definitely be in flux and look completely different once Whispers of the Old Gods is in uh, standard format. All right, well, we've broken down these players individually, but let's take a look at them side by side as the final matchup is set. We do have the bands in, so we can start talking about the decks and how they line up. Uh, Amnesiac versus Nostum. Nostum actually goes ahead and bans out that Murloc Paladin, and Amnesiac goes ahead and bans out the Agro Shaman. So these are actually identical bans if we think back to Saturday. Uh, so, Korra, are these bans warranted? Do you think that they went with these bans just because that's what they did in the previous game? The Murloc Paladin seems like one that we've talked about a lot that's just because he's uncomfortable with it. 
Do you think that's the case? I think that is very likely the case. Nostum versus Amnesiac before Nostum went 3-0, so I don't see why Nostum would want to change his ban. His plan clearly worked out really well the first time, and then Amnesiac, you know, might just think he got some bad luck, he had some bad draws, he didn't play badly at all, so why fix what isn't broken? In this case, they can just go ahead with the same bans, and likely the match might turn out differently. Yeah, real quick, I'm going to get your guys' predictions after seeing those deck lineups. Who do you think is going to take it all? Who do you think is going to take that Winter America's Championship, Raynad? I mean, Nassim took it 3-0 last time he played against Amnesiac, so I'd say Nassim. All right, and Cora? I'm going to have to agree with Nostum. I think he okay. has a lot of open tournament experience. Amnesiac still so young, definitely has more ladder experience. But in this case, I think Nostum just has a little bit of an edge. All right. Well, at home, let us know who you guys think is going to win and show your favorite player support on that social media. You can tweet at PlayHarson with the hashtag HTT and make sure you hashtag who you think is going to win. Either hashtag Amnesiac or hashtag Nostum. I'm super excited for this grand finals. Thank you once again, guys, for helping me recap the day and uh, giving your expert analysis. But the grand finals is set, so we're going to toss it to our casters to get into the action. Thank you, TJ. Eight players came to the America's Winter Championship looking to secure $25,000 and a trip to the Hearthstone World Championship at BlizzCon. We now have two remaining. Nostum, Amnesiac, we've heard what they think over at the sidebar. Sadl, you and I have been talking a lot over this weekend, and, and you told me something interesting as someone who has competed in a fair share of tournaments. You told me that preparation uh, is almost entirely what matters most when it comes into this, that the decks you lock in, the cards you choose, are such a big factor in this based on that. Uh, yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure exactly what percentage to put on it, but it's such a big deal. So much of how well you're going to do in a tournament is decided before you play a single card. It's your preparation. It's the tech cards that you put in your decks. Um, and it was pointed out, a, a tweet I actually saw, but just before we came online, that we saw that in the semifinal where it was... Um, extremely high-level play from Chess Dude up against an extremely high-level preparation strategy from Nostum, who had targeted Freeze Mage with his lineup and had that pay out by getting through to this final right now. Right, yeah. Savitz, looking at this, do you agree with his assessment that the decks are going to dictate who wins this, or is there room for innovation within the matches in unfavorable situations? I do think that there's a lot of room for like all, so all sorts of maneuvering. These two players definitely did their preparations right. I think they are very deserving uh, finalists, and either one can take it. Right, and as you see on social, these two players are neck and neck. There's people who are out there supporting them, tweeting to show that they think that these players are going to win. Uh, I actually, I'm going to go ahead and go against the sidebar on this one. I really like Amnesiac's chances here. This guy has impressed me all weekend. I've had the opportunity to talk to him, and he's young, and he may not necessarily have as much experience, but I really like this guy's heart. He's got a lot of high game knowledge. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first player, though, from Team Grand National Champions. It's Nostum. And Nostum has definitely made a statement here. Before this, he was primarily known as kind of a fun, entertaining streamer. Wasn't really taken too seriously in a competitive format. But already, even if he doesn't win from this position, he's made the statement that he is here to stay as a competitive Hearthstone player. Right, and up next, the 15-year-old Hearthstone prodigy for the last time this weekend, Team Archon's Amnesiac. Yeah, Amnesiac has been really impressive with his place all weekend long. I'm not surprised to see him in the finals right now. He was definitely one of the favorites going in, and he has made it so far. And uh, he's also my favorite to potentially take it all. Right, Amnesiac has talked at length that he feels like the decks he brought are reflective of how much training he's put in, how much practice time he's had, and he feels like he plays at so high a level that even if these aren't necessarily the optimal decks, he feels like he's more than equal to the task of taking this. Right, and I think it's important to say that the cream has really risen to the top in this tournament. I think there were three standout players. It's a shame we can only get two of them in the final, but three the three standout players, these two and Chess Dude, I think everyone would agree. All three of those were in the top four, and now we have a final between two people that no one would argue don't deserve to be here. Right, and looking at those bands again, uh, they were mentioned a little bit on the sidebar, but Shaman and Paladin banned, and once Amnesiac revealed that Paladin or revealed it to be anything, absolutely a game changer. And I have to imagine it changes how his opponents approach these bands. Anything banned, Savits, do you like it? Well, I, it's the smart thing to do for Nostum, for sure. His lineup, like Reynard has mentioned earlier, that um, the matchups for the 
anything Paladin are very pol polarized, and uh, he would have had a lot of good ones here. Personally, I'm a little bit disappointed to see that deck go out, because uh, it's really refreshing to see, and it's such a brave move to bring it here, but definitely the bans here are correct for both players. Shaman also uh, some a really troublesome deck for Amnesiac to deal with. Right. You agree with those bans? Yeah, I mean, I just echo everything Savit said. Yeah. He's a smart guy. I don't have too much to add to that, but we have uh, Warrior Mirrors and Druid Mirrors left as potential. They might not line up against each other, but the lineups remaining are very similar. I really want to see that Warrior Mirror. I'm not kidding, okay? Listen, yeah, I don't know, me either. No, yeah, no, I that's okay. I'll, I'll just be over here. We were talking about it before the match, and Nostam actually thinks that it would be like the greatest thing for viewers ever, because we might see a Golden Monkey showdown. It's very likely yeah. that it's going to happen if the... Oh, I was a Warrior, but just one Warrior. But it's very likely, even though the early game from the Warrior Mirror is very slow, a lot of armoring up, the Golden Monkey Showdown is so epic, and I want to see it on the big stage. Right, we might get the opportunity to, but we're going to hop into game one here again. This is the final match of this tournament. The winner of this goes to the Hearthstone World Championship, and opening up, it's going to be Amnesiac on Druid, and Nostum on that very potent Control Warrior. Really the surprise story of this tournament, how powerful it is. And Sadl, for the last time, walk us through, if you're the Druid, how do you get past this deck? Yeah, so normal Druid strategy is just to play one big thing at a time. You use Innovate to get one big thing down on the board early, and then you continue to play your curve. You you know, you play your big Pilot Shredder on four, your Druid of the Claw on five. The problem is against this, um, this Warrior deck, that one for one minion versus removal exchange isn't going to work out in your favor most of the time because they have so much removal to come down. So the key is really to find a way to spike on one turn to get multiple threats into play, overload the druid removal, uh, the warrior removal, sorry, and then use that as a platform. Yeah, and speaking of getting big minions out early, there was two innervates and a wild growth, but Amnesiac, not going to risk drawing too many spells, throws one oh, of the innervates back, decides that just having just one is going to be enough, and uh, his starting hand is looking great. Yeah, again, we see the explosive potential of an incredibly early Emperor Thorasan in Amnesiac's hand. How many early Emperors have we seen from Druids in this tournament? Right, it's been a fair few, and we talked about, you know, obviously when you're playing as a Druid, you're looking for wild growth, you're looking for innervate. Emperor Thorsen is the cherry on top, and it allows you to accelerate so quickly, even though you're not necessarily looking, getting those core cards out there. But look at this curve. Turn three, Shade of Naxxramas. Turn four, Innervate into Emperor Thorsen if he wants it. That's I'm really wow. intrigued by the fact that he played the top deck Shade there instead yeah. of the one that was in his hand. That's very, very interesting to me, because you coined Wild Growth on turn one. What that signals to your opponent is Shade of Naxxramas or Innovate 5 Drop. Those are the two things that are likely to happen. So he's just given Nostum the information that there is probably a card in his hand that that Wild Growth was supposed to set up. Whereas the card that was, was drawn, the second Shade, there's no possible information on that. Yeah, exactly my thoughts. That's interesting because he also went for the for the old Shade first and then he switched to right. the one that he just drew. It'll be interesting to hear his thoughts on why he chose to play the freshly drawn one instead. Right, now it might seem like a small consideration, but the highest echelons of the game, these are the things that matter, and these are the things the players are noticing. And it's why you see so much time on things like the mulligan, mm -hmm. because these mulligans telegraph so much about your hand and ultimately lead you to the predictions. I've spoken with a lot of the players over the course of the weekend, and they all start their stories of their matches by explaining, hey, I saw this, so I expected this. Yeah, quite often, based on how many cards your opponent has kept, you can rule out a lot of cards that he could potentially have. For example, nobody would keep uh, an Azure Drake in the starting hand, or in some matchups, and, and so on, and so on. So keep Keeping track of how many cards, what cards are the ones that were kept in the mulligans, you can rule out potential threats. Right, it's particularly potent in some matchups. For example, as a zoo player against Control Warrior, if you see the Warrior mulligan their whole hand, you're more likely to keep something aggressive like a Knife Juggler that would lose to a Fiery War Axe. It's a really important thing that tends to lead to both players just roping the mulligan in high-level situations. Right. Amnesiac did choose to play down an Emperor Thoris, and even though enough damage to clear it was represented on board between that Fiery War Axe, and we saw, obviously, the Taunt had just run into it. Taunt's still surviving here, but uh, looking at Awesome's hand, you know, what does he do in this situation? It's interesting, because there could be that potential that he wants to keep his shade hidden right now and just use one drawer to maybe pop that, but I would probably be leaning towards just using the shade that's on the board and uh, see what pops out of the Deathlord first. 
Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, Shredder is nice, means he can now play that sh extra Shade of Naxxramas out on the board, and this is exactly what we were talking about before. He now has a consolidated board, multiple minions requiring more than just the spot-for-spot -spot removal that the Warrior wants to play. Yeah, and not only is the Shredder hard to remove, but it's also not a Battlecry minion. Like, like there's another Ancient of Lore in the deck, and getting that on the board, yes, it's a big minion, but you don't get the chance to draw with it later on. I was going to say, realistically, Shade and Shredder are probably the best minions you can get off that death board, so... Uh, that's working out very well for Amnesiac. We see Double Savage Roar in his hand. What we do not no. see a Brawl in Nostum's hand. And we've talked at length over the course this weekend about just how deadly Shade of Naxxramas can be for the Warrior to deal with because Brawl is realistically its only way to clear it. Yeah, sometimes you can uh, get it out with the Revenge if you can get your life total low enough to get the damage boost on the Revenge. But that's a little bit tricky. And uh, if you're low enough to use the Revenge efficiently, then you're probably in the combo range. Yep. Right, so looking up at Amnesiac's hand here, you can see the value of that Emperor that he played. It wasn't the best Emperor, as you pointed out, Rob, but what it allowed him to do is get to that Ancient of Law quickly, which he was looking at his hand, he could see that potentially there wasn't much to do for several turns, but speaking of getting to Ancient of Law quickly, there's something that actually prevents it unless he wants to bring that Shade out of stealth. Yeah, interesting play there. I think that's excellent value from that Dooms here. It kind of forces the Shade out of stealth here, and at worst you gain 7 health. And yeah, what I really like about that is because you'd seen the Emperor Thoris in at that point, you know that if he has a 7 drop, it's going to be on 6 mana. So you are basically forcing that reaction, as Sadid said. Get that Shade out. So he did get something out of it, and we are now going to the Grand Tournament. Jessicar Trueheart comes down. Is that lethal right there? Dostom did not go for the Brawl. Uh, 13, 13 plus 8 plus 8? That is a large amount of damage. I believe that is just lethal, yeah. That's crazy. Wow, just like Has that. Has living roots as well if he needs it. Right, Amnesiac really quick to identify that. Pulls the trigger. He goes for it. 16 damage between the Shred and the, Sh or Shade and the Shredder. Hero power, uh, not required. He's got enough damage, and he is going to go ahead and take game one in this series. I wonder if that was a little bit of a hasty decision from Nostam to just play the Justic Arc, because there was a lot of power on the board, and even if there was only one draw art, that would have been so much damage. And what's really interesting to me is that it seemed like the his line of thinking was that with the Doomsayer play was to get that Shade out of hiding. He had the Death Spite in hand that he could use to target it, but then after the shade was revealed, he didn't follow up with that death spite to remove the shade. He just went for the long-term investment of the Justicar. Obviously, if he does live that one turn, it starts to net him health over the course of the game. But yeah, there definitely was at least a lot of decisions there. He had a lot of different lines of play, and I'm surprised that he didn't even rope out there. That's one of the turns where where I would imagine that a lot of players would uh, use all of their time for the thinking. Right, and we've sent it out over the course of this weekend as players just bringing down that uh, Jessicar Trueheart on turn six, even with something else on the board, because as you said, they're looking for that long-term health gain. Mm -hmm. But with so much raw power on the board, the potential for, as you said, even one Savage Roar to come out and make that a very unwieldy situation, how do you think Nostum is going to be questioning that turn after the fact? Yeah, the thing with Jessicar on six is that often... Turn seven, turn eight, you quite often commit all of your mana to removal anyway. You'll equip a Death Spite, maybe bash something for seven mana. So you don't actually start getting that advantage from the hero power until turn nine, turn 10 anyway. So quite often it's correct just to hold back, even though that temptation just feels good to load it onto the board and start having that, that promise of the tank up. Uh, re rescuing you from the Druid pressure. Right, so Amnesiac goes up 1-0 early in the series. The potential for the Control Warrior Mirror is still there, but Savits, you are going to be denied. Justice is done as we have no. made the Control Warrior Mirror once more. And Amnesiac goes to his double oil rogue. And I mentioned double oil because that is something that could really give him the edge in this matchup where the rogue only has a finite amount of damage against tra or traditional Control Warrior. Right, there is double oil, but the the important thing is that there is no deck hand or charge minion at all from what we've seen. So to get that oil to really do work, he's going to have to stick something on the board. And the deck that he's up against is pretty damn good at preventing you from sticking things on the board. Yeah, one oil or two oils. This is a bad matchup for right. Amnesiac, and he definitely gets to needs to get things lined up in order to be able to take this one. The reason why it's so bad is that the warrior weapons are just so efficient at yep. dealing with all the minions, and the warrior doesn't even need to really try to kill the rogue necessarily. As long as the warrior keeps clearing every single minion with those weapons, with the bash, with the shield slams and the executes, he should be in good shape. Yeah, and the rogue just naturally throughout the game with, with you know, Sprint, Fan of Knives and Azir Drakes, they push themselves to fatigue eventually. There's a finite amount of damage in the deck if you can remove the minions. So as you say, you don't really have to focus on putting together any kind of winning game plan with the warrior. All right, Savits, you brought up that things are going to have to line up for Amnesiac if he's going to win. But looking at Nostum's hand, I would say things are in a better spot than they could be. 
Yeah, both players with uh, below average starting hands for sure. Nostam without a weapon and uh, Amnesiac's first minion is looking to be on turn 5, which is a little bit later than you would like to. Yeah, you want to be developing those early SI7 agents, things like Violet Teachers, even Azadrake on 5 is great. Belcher obviously can protect him, but if it just comes down on turn 5 and you're playing against this warrior, which is so predicated on removal as opposed to early aggression, doesn't feel that good. Not at all. Amnesiac hoping for at least a sprint, if not a minion. Pilot of Shredder would probably be the best card. So Joanne gets another Evis rate and another hero power pass. Yeah, another absolute whiff. I was uh, contemplating just on Nostum's turn there whether the uh, the Tempo Doomsayer was worth it on his part because having seen him whiff for several turns, he would have um, been may maybe been expecting a 4-drop from his opponent, but his mind went one turn later. He's now saying, okay, if your hand was that bad, you must have a minion you want to play by now, so I'm going to block it out. But the prep sprint draw is awesome for something to do this turn to prevent that Doomsayer from blocking his turn. That is perfect for Amnesia. Getting that sprint now, that... Uh, Doomsayer is preventing minions from getting played unless it was killed, and you don't really want to use the cards to deal with the Doomsayer. Now, we, after that sprint, he's going to have 10 cards, and he gets a poison, so no cards going to be burned or wasted. Perfect. Yeah, otherwise he would have had to think about just backstabbing the, the Doomsayer for no reason, just to have another card drawn. But he's going to go ahead and poison here and swing the damage at face just to uh, play around potential answers to weapons here. Right, and we talked earlier on the day about how the hero power of the Paladin lines up against the hero power of the Warrior. Uh, doesn't necessarily go well for the warrior, but let's talk about how the rogue hero <laughs> power goes against the warrior hero power, where that is absolutely a win for the warrior. Yeah. Rogue pokes you for one, maybe it makes a new dagger if it has nothing to do, but you're always out healing that dagger, so that is a net what win for the warrior player. Yeah, yeah and, and that's the before they've played Justicar Trueheart, so... Yeah, and it's also really hard to use the, use the weapon to clear minions, because the warrior doesn't really play many minions that uh, would, would die to that one extra damage. Yeah, hard to hard to believe Amnesiac actually does play minions with as few as we've seen in this deck, but right. they are in there. Sludge Belcher, SI7 Agent, Violet Shredder, not uncommon to or Violet Shredder. Violet, Violet Shredder. Violet Teacher, I, it, uh, piloted Teacher. Is that right? Freudian slip, Rob? Are you revealing the new corrupted minion, Violet Shredder? <laughs> <laughs> there goes my job, guys. But, uh, it's going to be Piloted Shredder, Violet Teacher, Sludge Belcher, low feb at the top ends, but it's not a deck that runs a ton of minions. Right, it's kind of the, the price of a mission of playing the deck is that the strength of it is all these super efficient spells that can double up as burst damage when you need them or as tempo control on the board to protect your existing minions. But the price of that is playing a large amount of spells in your deck and you sometimes get these very whiffy draws where you don't have the pressure you need that you can back up with the spells. Yeah, Nostom still looking for a weapon, does not find it, but Bash gets the job done in combination with the slam on that Belcher. Right, Savitz, as someone who's played a fair bit of Rogue in your time, do you feel like the Rogue player has to kind of go in a lot earlier on the offensive to make this work, or is Amnesiac still looking at a window where he can possibly pull this out? Yeah, the, the Rogue player definitely has to be the one who's uh, hmm. putting the, the pressure up, and something like early oil can work out great in yeah. some situations. Now we see here instead that Violet Teacher, not to be confused with the Violet Shredder, and the SI7 agent to do the two damage, so he does have a force on the board, and. It's not necessarily one you're going to probably look at brawling, unless I'm mistaken, Saddle. Uh, I don't think there's too much of an emergency just yet. You can start using some of these spot removal cards that are building up in your hand, but um, Savit's pointed out at the start of this matchup how how solid the weapons are from the Warrior in this matchup, and that's the one thing that Nostum is is, is missing right now, is those crucial weapons, like Death Spite in particular, is just MVP in this matchup. Yeah, Amnesiac with a lot of damage in his hand. He has the oil, double Evis rates, no flurry. A little bit low on minions, but uh, if he play, was to play the low tap here, he could lock out the brawl and uh, potentially push for a lot of damage with his board on the following turn. Right, I really like the look of that play you're suggesting, Savits, or at least uh, positing over the possibility of, but this looks like Amnesiac is just going to go ahead and sap that Death Lord, play an SI7 agent, and you know, does he want to do anything else with that three mana other than dagger up? No, he is going to equip the dagger here, and I think what this is setting up for is if some of this board sticks on this turn, the next turn he can potentially backstab something as a combo activator, tinker sharp soil oil to put a ton of pressure on the board, and then drop Lotheb alongside that to lock out the removal, and that will be his big push. Unfortunately for him, the brawl is there to prevent that. Right, and the Death Lord comes right back, and 
I like the brawl there because if you're playing against the rogue and you know there aren't too many minions in the deck, when you see that many minions, it feels okay. Yeah, that wasn't like the maximum value you can get out of a brawl. It only killed a 3 3 and a slime, but he has a second one in his hand. So if there was a violet teacher spawning a lot of 1 1s or a lot of other minions coming in, he would still have access to another board clear. Saddle, you, you look like you're thinking something. So, uh, yeah, I was just reacting. That the, exactly the same play does come down. It actually ends up being pretty uh, solid against the, the Death Lord that comes out there. He made the play on the previous turn, setting up exactly this. Backstab, Tinker's Oil, Lotheb to prevent removal. But this is nice timing from Nostum to be able to draw the Fiery War Axe. That's a form of removal that doesn't get locked out by Lotheb, and the Belcher comes down. I do a little bit of math here. We see that he would have ten, he's going to have 10 mana on the next turn. Amnesia could play down something like Azure Drake, Eviscerate, Eviscerate. That is a lot of damage, but is it enough? Because he, he's, if he had 11 mana, I'm pretty sure it would be. With yeah, the Drake, I think double Eviscerate Flurry. Yeah, I think if that second Drake drawn was a preparation, he would have had lethal this turn. It's still really close, because he could go for I get Drake and, uh, and Flurry to clear off the Belcher. Backstab, Backstab to the, the Slime. slime. Yep. Eviscerate once. That would be. So that's 10 damage to face. He's at 11, total. 8 through. Yeah. Five, fr five from the spell yep. powered up Flurry. Yep. Five from sure. the Eviscerate and eight from the minions on the board. So he could put Nostam down to 3 HP already. Well, it looks like he's going to start the turn off with the Azure Drake. Possibly looking to bump into that preparation you guys mentioned. And he's just the one more. I mean, honestly, do you just follow through with that line anyway? Why not, right? Like, he so, has yeah. to do so much to answer it. He has to clear the board. He has to armor up. He has to put a torn in the way. He has to do so many things to be able to prevent that second eviscerate being able to seal the game. Right, and we see here, Vile Teacher comes down. Or Vile Teacher, rather, already down. But going to go ahead and propagate those minions. And yeah, as you guys said, he's pushing a lot of damage and forcing an immediate reaction from Nostum if he wants to stay alive. Amnesiac with potential 10 damage coming in with the trick, Eviserate, Eviserate. Oh, is there any There's way nothing. out for Nostom? Yeah, he just simply cannot gain enough damage. He could have made a card draw play with the Acolyte and the Revenge, maybe, but his, his instinct tells him to play the Brawl here, and by playing the Brawl, he just locks himself out of any possibility of gaining enough life to get out of range of this double Eviserate. Amnesiac, no stranger to Rogue. This is by far his most played class. Absolutely swears by it. You know, it's not uncommon considering what we saw at the World Championship last year. Yeah, Rogue players, when they bring Rogue to tournament, they tend to be successful with it. It's a deck with a, a huge gap between the skill floor and the skill ceiling, so when you are incredibly competent at it, there's so much room to outplay your opponent, to overcome bad matchups, because the discrepancy between the average play and the optimal play is so high with the deck. Yeah. All right, we're going to see. Nostum doesn't have anything that can bail him out at this point. No, the best he can do here is to armor up... <laughs> As ridiculous as it sounds, he could have coined out the Shield Slam on the 1-1 one, one to have one more HP. Right. But regardless of that, even if he even if he did that play, he would have still been dead to the Drake double Evis. And uh, Amnesiac gonna go up 2-0 and zero already in the series. And this was an unfavored matchup. We were talking yep. about this at the start. This is very difficult to navigate, but Amnesiac found that sprint, found the resources, found the window through which he could possibly win, and is now gonna go up 2-0 in the final match of this championship. Now, I'm conf I'll confess, I'm not a huge rogue player myself, but I've watched, for example, Mr. Yagu, one of the best rogue players in the yep. world, stream a ton of this deck. And he has a actually decent success rate against Control Warrior, and one of the ways he does that is by he purely mulligans for preparation and sprint. He sends everything else back. Um, and we, what we saw in that game is that wasn't a tactic that Amnesiac was maybe deliberately trying to employ, but we saw that crucial turn where the Doomsayer was dropped, and then the prep sprint was a, allowed to be played in response to that, which just gave Amnesiac so many resources over the course of the rest of the game. Yeah, I also feel like that prep sprint on turn 5 for Amnesiac, that was kind of the, the point where he started to, to look quite good in, the, in that uh, particular game. Right, Amnesiac now up 2-0, just needs one more win on that Control Warrior. Might be the Control Warrior mirror, but uh, obviously more favorable decks for Nostum to bust out. But we're seeing Amnesiac slightly favored on our social media poll. Uh, say it's a 60-40 there, maybe in a 55-45. So uh, again, if you are out there, if you're a Nostum supporter, if you like Wacky Bob, get out there and hashtag Nostum. Show him you are supporting him from home. Uh, if you're an Amnesiac fan, obviously hashtag Amnesiac. Nostam needs to find wins with all three of his decks, and I'm just like, please pick the warrior. I want to see the monkey showdown. If if, he, if Nostam is to lose this series, what's a better way to go out than uh, in a golden monkey match? 
What's an even better thing is to get a first win. And I think when he looks over the rest <laughs> of his lineup, uh, as much as he cares about your amusement suites and probably mine and Saddles as well, he's going to look at what gives him the chance to climb back into this. And look, here's the thing, right? Second place in this, you still bring home a lot of money, a lot of points, but you want to win. And uh, Druid into Control Warrior, Savitz. You're making a face. I mean, uh, it's a pretty good pick. Uh, Druid, <laughs> <laughs> Druid in my books is the, is the, is the favorite in this matchup. And uh, it's definitely his chances to win with the Druid are better than in the 50-50, in the so to say, Control Warrior Mirror. Were you really expecting the Control Warrior Mirror here? I Sabitz? mean, he has to win with all three decks, so it's quite possible that he would have started out with it. Why sure. not? Sure, uh, because I want to uh, win he... game one. What's happening here, Savitz, is that Nostum is going to fully set up the drama. He's going to climb back to 2-2, two, two, and then we're going to go out in game five on the Golden yes, Monkey Showdown. I like it. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Well, looking at the opening hands here, Amnesiac probably going to toss away Harrison unless Malfury and Claws suddenly start counting as a weapon. Probably not going to keep that Sylvanas either. Despite is what I would consider the only keep in this hand. Yeah, Despite is definitely your boy in this matchup. That's what you want in the hand. Um, so he'll be keeping that. <laughs> Wild Growth, much the same from the Druid side. That is an instant keep. Wild Growth much prepared, uh, preferred to the one-off spike of Innovate early in this matchup for the reasons that I've discussed. You want that constant mana growth, and honestly, Innovate is sometimes more powerful in the mid-game to play two minions at once. Okay, that's interesting. Nostam chose to keep both of his five drops. I was ex huh. expecting him to potentially keep one, right? but uh, the second one... Uh, I personally oh. might have... Well, now that makes it look like really bad, but that was unfortunate, drawing two more fives. But uh, I personally would have maybe leaned towards trying to find a Shade of Nax Ramas right. or a Piloted Shredder for that turn three where he has four mana. Yeah, I totally agree with you. It's It's been made to look even more stupid than, than possibly it is just by the, the draw of all the five drops. But keeping two does seem a little bit ambitious with all the positive draws you could get to go with that wild growth. Do want to point out though, once he starts chaining together those five drops, he will be putting a lot of raw power on the board. Four six is not a convenient stat line for the warrior to remove. So, and Shredder, uh, where were you? What were you doing? That is the one extra card that he would have had if he. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. yeah. Is that how it works? I'm I not so know. sure. Maybe yeah. Not. yeah, but Death Spite in combination with the Piloted Shredder here is going to be excellent for dealing with that 4-6 bear. And this is a situation that I've talked about where it's, it's just one minion at a uh, time at the moment. And we're just we're kind of fine with that as the Warrior player because we have plenty of options in our hand to deal with the situation. I love this from Nostrum, actually, the charge here, because oh. now we immediately get the situation. Two minions in play, much harder to deal with. Yeah, Belcher does die to a Death Spite, but still not too bad. Something small like a shade of Nax Ramas would have been easily cleared with the uh, with the Death Spite to Death Rattle and the revenge that the, we can see in Amnesiac's hand. Right, and you brought up the, the magic number two when it comes to playing the Druid mid-range against Control Warrior. You never necessarily want to put more than two minions on the board because it obviously leads to a more favorable brawl unless you're you're looking to close that with something like Lothab to get basically the end of the game. But putting two minions on the board is not necessarily always the best for the Warrior to remove conveniently. So right. I definitely like this. Yeah, it can depend on, um, yeah, it's basically risk assessment, you know, how hard do you have to push to be able to win the game, how secure is your position, sometimes you do have to go all in against that brawl, but for the most part, this is a fairly comfortable matchup for the Druid, so they can afford to play it um, fairly pedestrianly, not take too many huge risks. Yep, Amnesiac just gonna go with that Belzer here, the 4-1 and the Slime Mark, got a, got a, well, he could actually Azure Trick and, uh, and Hero of Power instead. Yep. I'm like, a little bit surprised that he didn't Trick first, but not a big deal. Yeah, Nostum is taking pretty quick turns here. And, uh, one thing I'd like to see is maybe him slow down just a little bit and consider these options more because uh, it seems like this line was a good one, but at some point when you're playing really quickly, you are just bound to make a mistake. And it's one of those things in this situation, you know, mistakes like this can, can give you fits later on. Yeah, there's not really many or any cards that, that he could have drawn from Death Drake to change his play, but in general, if you're drawing cards, it's better to draw the cards first, just in case that you there's, no some, there's a card that games. you didn't remember about that would make you have even a better turn. And I think what's interesting is we didn't see it that turn. Amnesiac slowed down and considered his options. It was quite a complex turn, but on turns where things are straightforward, Amnesiac is playing very quickly as well. And from my perspective, just watching this, it feels like Amnesiac is the more comfortable of the two players. Yeah. And maybe him matching the pace of Nostum is almost an encouragement to Nostum to keep playing at this pace because he feels like it's working to his favor right now. Yeah, I do think that Amnesiac, from what I've seen him play, that he, he tends to always play quite fast. Okay. And uh, maybe like, consider his options already on his opponent's turn and uh, his style is very fast. But I do agree with that assessment that Amnesiac seems to be a little bit more comfortable with these uh, 
fast turns, and uh, I would hope for Nostam to slow down just a tiny bit. Right. right, and that seems ridiculous to say, right? Amnesiac's 15. This is a guy who yeah. we've never seen uh, in a tournament necessarily of this scale. You know, this is the America's Winter Championship, and all weekend, win or lose, obviously he felt a little bit bad after, you know, he felt he underperformed in one of his series, but otherwise, he's just been the very picture of being comfortable in this tournament. Yeah, and he's, he's had some experience in some decent-sized tournaments, nothing on this level, but, you know, you don't you don't get to be a part of Archon without taking part in some huge events at some point in your career, so he probably is the slightly more experienced on a, on a big-ish stage than Nostum, but this is a foreign environment to him, and as you said, incredibly impressive that uh, a kid of just 15 years old can, can handle this. Yeah, here against that, that death spite, Shredder, Shredder, I can't think of anything better. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. If that's uh, if that's gonna be the quote of the finals, at least it rhymes. <laughs> Gromash, not a terrible option here if he wants to try and fight back onto this board. A um, little bit short of defensive options. Kind of a few cards stuck in hand right now. Revenge not effective at full value. Brawl is looking down at a couple of death rattle minions, not particularly effective either. So uh, Gromash might be the the option here just to try and defend himself against this board a little bit. Yeah, it's really scary to play it though because he's going he's down to a combo range, I believe. If right. he was to go with that, so shield block might seem like a, like the play that he has Ooh. to make, even though. It might not feel that good. Yeah, I was about to say, if he shield blocks, though, he really does need some help from the top of his deck to give himself something something nice to do that turn. And the bash that he picked up was pretty fantastic. Right, yeah. it might not necessarily seem like a whole lot because there's still an entire other Shredder up there. Yeah. But just being able to gain health while removing the first part of the minion. And Shredder is one of those minions that absolutely punishes the Warrior player because Warrior has to use so much removal on it. And oftentimes, it's just incapable of fully removing the full minion. Yeah, the weapons do take out the Shredders quite well, but doing that just costs so much life total. Ooh. Whoa, what is that? That load them. them! That load them! Locks out the brawl! It's so much pressure now! The coin is in hand, but of course you can't coin brawl under low theb conditions, so this is such a consolidated amount of pressure now here from Nostum. What a time to pick up that, uh, that low theb. It's going to protect Nostum's board, and if it came one turn later, Amnesiac would have been able to brawl anyway, right. just paying that 10 mana. All right, let's look at what... Is Ooh. that lethal? No, that's not lethal quite yet, but Ancient of Lore, big pickup, gonna allow him to get even more cards if he chooses to use it. Might just choose to swipe the Grom and right. then swipe face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, swiping Grom here allows him to push more damage to face this turn because he's, he's he doesn't have to trade with it. Honestly, he doesn't really have to trade with it anyway because of how, how high health he is right now, but the Ancient of Lore will help him just dig nicely to that Savage Roar. You know, you've already seen the Sylvanas at this point. Savit, is there merit to possibly just putting that Keeper over the Grove to damage into Amnesiac's face? Like, what are you saving it for? Uh, just, uh, I think that the lore is just so much stronger of a minion. There could have been an option where he just swipes the Grom and then, like, Keeper face. Uh, I could see, imagine that happening, but going for the draw with the Ancient of Lore to, to try to find the Savage Roar uh, seems, like a, seems like the line of play that I personally like the most. Sure. Yeah, and the first Ancient of Law chain draws him into the second Ancient of Law. So even though we haven't hit the Savage Roar just yet, he's going to have all the resources in the world to clutch out this game. Amnesiac going to have to find something special here as the Warrior player if he wants to get this over and done with right now with a 3-0 victory. Yeah, Vitality Totem might not seem like the best result. I do want to point out it will keep him topped off as long as it survives. And it benefits from Savage Roar, so not necessarily the worst thing to get out of a Shredder. Yeah, Slam could clear the board fully here, but Amnesiac may be running a little bit low on cards, so it's it's hard to pull that trigger because because the card draw from from it in the future would be very beneficial. Yeah, I think we're going to get an indicator here of just exactly how desperate Amnesiac is because the decision whether to slam or not this this two two actually says a lot about where he feels he is in this matchup right now. Yeah, it's there really you go. Yeah, it's really hard with just a big game hunter and Harrison Jones as the minions that he has <laughs> right. to, to really do much things against the Druid. Right, speaking about being nervous to pull the trigger, we've seen that Gorehal just sit in the hand, and Gorehal's great when you have health to spend to get rid of minions, but that is not a place Amnesiac is currently at. Absolutely not. Second lore is played, more cards drawn, still no Savage Roar in hand, so he's going to have to take his time to get some work done here, but the Gorehal is finally going to come down, cleanly take out this 5-5 minion. He goes down to 15 health, can go back up to 17 with the hero power, which means a Savage Raw draw would be lethal here. Does he even have enough with the... Oh, oh never mind. Goodness. <laughs> I believe he may have had enough with the two Innovates anyway. 
Is that Could right? I force of nature swipe. In our rate, in our rate, swipe. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was enough that was already. Enough already. Exactly yeah, he, right. he got yeah. the win, guys. He doesn't need to go for the win plus. So right. he's, uh, he's set right here. He is going to go ahead and bring the series to 2 1. So hats off to Nostum. He's still in this series. Has to win two more games. Amnesiac still in a great spot, though, with that control warrior. And I think Druid, we can agree, was probably its weakest matchup. For sure, yeah. I think there's there's no doubt about that. You know, I've, I've talked to Len, the Druids have to get a little bit more creative. It's not as free as it used to be back in the day, but still an uphill struggle for Warriors. Golden Manga Showdown. It's coming, guys. It's coming <laughs> at some point. It will happen. I Okay, I will say, I am excited about the prospect of the Golden Monkey coming out. I'm just not excited about the hour and a half leading up to it of <laughs> armoring up and not using removal because nobody plays minions. The thing about the Control Warrior matchup, Rob, that you have to learn is that it teaches you important life lessons, and that's that without the lows, you can't appreciate the highs. You have to sit through the five or six turns of armor pass to get to the really, really juicy stuff at the end. Ah, the Tao of Saddle. I look forward to being able to buy this book on a digital download somewhere maybe like 299 but yeah we are getting closer to that control warrior mirror uh yeah we won't go there just yet i would imagine i think i, we, I think, I think we're gonna we see might. the warlock i mean oh. i think <laughs> i think I, it's, it's reno lock with the ooze teched yeah, in i think so he, it has a pretty solid matchup against the warrior overall you can just keep life tapping load up on as many threats as possible so it should be in a pretty decent position yeah the ooze is definitely teched in exactly for, for that type of matchups he knows that if there's a gore howl which could otherwise be a huge problem the ooze will take care of that mm -hmm. there are also some deck cards that are a little bit off like the Kazan mystic right not going to do anything special against the warrior but it's one of the huge benefits of gaining information as you play throughout a tournament because say this matchup was to happen early on without the information out there, D turn four death spike comes down. All right, cool, I'll lose that. But now with the knowledge that Gore Howl is in the deck, you can guarantee that that Gore Howl will be the target for the Acidic Ooze that Nostum will, will want to target unless he can really can't help it. Yeah, sometimes you might be forced into situations where you have to use it on a on a different right. weapon, like a death spike, but yep. you definitely want to try to aim it at the Gore Howl if anyhow possible. Right, I do want to point out, we were talking to Amnesiac earlier before the match, and he very candidly pointed out that Nostum's Reno Lock did in fact have Acidic Swamp Ooze. So, from his mouth, and... Oh, no, we avoid it! We continue on, it is Reno Lock versus Control Warrior Savid. Stop looking so crestfallen. It's happening, but Nostum needs to win this one <laughs> to force it. Hey, right. I've already told you, Savid, it's going to be maximum drama. Game 5, oh, Golden baby. Monkey Showdown. <laughs> right, right now we see that Nostum is opening up or not opening up rather, but he's hopping into this game with that Reno Lock. We have seen, obviously, that like other Reno Locks, it has those tech cards. Kazan Mystic, going to be useless in this matchup. Acidic yeah. Swamp Ooze will be anything but useless. Mm. Yeah, but also, the, the the different ways you can build Reno Lock will really have a big impact in this matchup. TJ early on gave a very solid analogy of Reno Lock just being like a toolbox that you picked what you wanted to put in there and it dramatically shifted your matchups against various different things. So the decision of Nostan to bring this particular build is going to have an impact of how it lines up against this super heavy removal warrior. Yeah, I wonder if Nostan is going to also go for the type of max out on the, on the life tap strategy that we saw earlier from, uh, from some players. Because... Uh, it can happen. It can be uh, one of the most efficient uh, way to to get to those um, those most important cards as fast as possible. Right, and Nostum, uh, you know, he also has a weapon that can be broken, and we see that Harrison Jones in the hand of Amnesiac. But Jaraxxus's hands can, and over the course of the weekend, have been put in a museum. So that's something Nostum has to be aware of. No doubt he's done his homework. And uh, suddenly this forces Jaraxxus back to kind of a last-ditch effort as opposed to one of your main win conditions. Well, Pilot of Shredder picks up by Nostum. That's a great card to have against the Warrior. Yeah, he's curving out pretty fantastically from here. Unfortunately that for him, the Imgang boss is going to come down against that death spite if it happens. But he has a nice solid 3-4-5 curve that he can play out here if he wants to just get the pressure down on the board. Yep, Imgang boss not so good against the death spite, but the Shredder will certainly be at least Star Seeker. <laughs> Oh, we're so close. <laughs> Savit is literally <laughs> rubbing his hands together right now. This is actually the most evil I've ever seen Savit's look. And it's, we're, we're like one at least star seeker away from this tur just turning into Savit's stream. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is not the matchup where I was like expecting to see it, but I'll take it if it happens, if it's meant to be. If you're just given Golden Monkey, I, I guess you'll take it. <laughs> I would be very excited to see that. Obviously, at least Star Seeker and the map into the Golden Monkey have the potential to lead to some fairly comical situations. 
Steam Wheel Sniper yet again. Ooh. Two in a row, I believe, of Pilot Shredders. Now you can aim that life tap. Right here. No. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that it, way. You just trail off. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's not even worth finishing, but... Yeah. Can't uh, force your opponent to... to <laughs> draw a card. Force Sludge Belcher to draw <laughs> a card. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sludge Belcher has sure a hand? Yeah, fine. Yeah, if that had rolled four on that implosion, <laughs> would have been nice and able to mortal coil it. Uh, this actually... I think this turn may end up having a uh, far-reaching implication since he couldn't just mortal coil the Sludge Belcher, forced to bring out that Dark Bomb. Yeah, it's a huge difference. Dark Bomb is a card that can quite often be used as that last final push over the line for lethal damage at the end of the game against this heavy control deck when it comes down to the fatigue turns. It's also a fantastic mid-range removal card. And on top of that, he's one card less deep in his, in his deck because he couldn't use the mortal coil. Leroy Jenkins drawn by Nostam. Well, I was looking at the power of Whelming here for the removal, but... Since this is the type of Reno walk that he's playing, he's likely to want to hold on to that BO for the combo. Right, so speaking to Saddle's earlier point, there are a lot of ways you can build Reno locks. One such way is this combo lock that uses cards like Leroy Jenkins, Power Overwhelming, Faceless Manipulator to deal a ton of burst damage all at once, and this is what Nostum is playing. Yeah, and the key point here is that more and more players have switched to Arcane Golem as their charge minion of choice. Leroy, a little bit more awkward to use. You have to Emperor at least one part of the combo to make it happen. You have five mana Leroy, five mana Faceless, one mana Power Overwhelming. So you just have to hit, hit, sorry, hit Emperor on any one of those cards. Um, but having Leroy instead of the Arcane Golem, the extra burst damage can just be that extra point I you need no to push through you. against a heavy life gain uh, class like Warrior. Yeah, personally, I like the, the Arcane Golem version just a tiny bit more, but both are very much viable. Right, but in, in particular matchups, heavier, heavier control matchups, Priests, Reno Locks, for example, it can be very, very positive to have the Leroy Jenkins. But as you said, most players yep. agree with you. They've switched to the Arcane Golem, just a little bit more consistent overall. Yeah, I completely agree. In this matchup, that extra damage might help out a lot, whereas against more aggressive decks, it's just uh, the Leroy is just too late because their mana cost is so high. Yep. Right, we're going to see that Sylvanas hit the board for Amnesia. Create a pretty tense board state. Nothing Nossum can really intuitively play around unless he uses that Iron Beak Owl, which of course we are going to see come out. And Sylvanas now just a 5-5, still a force to be reckoned with. And Acidic Swamp is in Nossum's hand, but he's not going to use it on that Fiery War Axe. Not necessarily the target he's looking for, knowing that Gorehell's in there. I'm kind of evaluating right now, was the Owl really necessary against uh, when, when you don't really have anything worth stealing on the board? Mm. It, it does add up to the, the, the revenge, and uh, Amnesiac is playing too. I guess the thinking is, what else could I possibly silence in this deck? He's seen one Belcher. He's, did he see her Death Lord early on? No, I don't think so. So there's still there's still quite a few taunts left in the deck that he could potentially need to silence out of the way to activate the Leroy combo. Uh, silencing an Acolyte of Pain can yeah. be extremely powerful right. sometimes because they're... Whoa! That's a pretty solid draw. <laughs> Nossum, Nossum pulls the trigger on that Twisting Nether and... Oh! Reno Jackson! That is huge, Savids. Tell us why. That's that's not a bad card to, to get. Some some newer viewers might think that uh, in this situation it would be a disaster because you know, the battle cry is so powerful and uh, and the, the deck is kind of built around it to get that powerful heal. But he's playing against a control warrior and I think that the, having the four minion with four and six as stats is pretty good in this situation. Yeah, it really is. Just jammed on the board spiteful smith that isn't going to buff his jaraxxus weapon but you know the stats are solid and this isn't a deck really that pressures you too hard in the removal warrior so really reno jackson would probably just be used to buy you extra turns of fatigue at the end of the game more than anything and uh, nostum is going to take this take this opportunity just to jam jaraxxus onto the board he's going to make the push to go right now start getting those six sixes down on board but savitz what's in the hand it's and jones and uh those hands wow. are about to belong in a museum. Can't wait to wait, see wait, what wait. So for, for us non-role players on the desk, are his hands literally being ripped off right now by this Harrison Jones? Uh, I think when I talked to, to some people at Blizzard, it was a kinder, gentler thing. We just asked him to you know put his hands in a box and I carry see. them back okay. to the museum. But right. uh, it's still not great for Jaraxxus. Yeah, if there was no Harrison in Amnesiac's hand, uh, that Terex would be so, so, so good. But this Harrison is going to make the game really interesting. Amnesiac right now evaluating if he should just maybe bash, shield slam, shield slam to prevent the burning any cards that he gets from that uh, from that re from the Harrison Jones because he will draw so many cards that his hand is going to be full anyway. Yeah, I think I like this though overall. Just like hold on to the the, the shield slam or the execute. Just. 
play two cards. He is still going to burn one, but I like this play. He just fills up his hand on so many resources that the one burned card on average shouldn't matter too much. Picks up that Gorhal, picks up the Grom. Those are two huge cards that he will have been looking for. Yeah, that Grom in particular is so important because that is what gives him the potential to finish the game off as early as next turn. So Nasim took a very aggressive line there, decided he was just going to go for it, knowing that Harrison Jones is in the hand. What do you guys think of that play? I mean, there are two possible times you, times you can do it. You can do it early and say, okay, this is the least likely you will ever be to have Harrison Jones in your hand. Or you can try and hold out and do it as late as possible so that the Harrison Jones is too much a threat for fatigue to be playable. Um, I don't mind the early play. It's risky. It's all in. But he sensed blood on that turn. He made the aggressive line where with the Leroy power overwhelming in hand, he didn't need that much extra damage built up over a couple of turns to win the game. Right, so... What happens when a deck with seemingly unlimited removal comes up against a hero power <laughs> that generates almost unlimited minions? Savits, who do you think is favored from this point out? I mean, looking at the hand, it's Amnesiac with uh, so much burst potential. The fact that Nostom's health is capped at 15 is, is so bad for him because he does have that heal, but, but unfortunately it wouldn't do anything right now because it's already maxed out. Yeah, and with Gore Howl and Gromash Hellscream in hand, he does have the potential and a bash as well, just to start throwing damage at face at some point and testing the waters. And then we don't have that many defensive plays in hand from Nostum. He has the antique hillbot that can heal him on a one-off occasion, but there's no Sun Fury Protector, no Defender of Argus that he can use to put up the big walls with those 6-6 six, six minions. Uh, unfortunately, Demon of Wrath is not the AoE or, or the spell that he was looking for. Dark Bomb would have been excellent. Even Hellfire would have gotten the job done as in form of uh, being an easy removal for the Justicar. I remember we made the point earlier on about how crucial that implosion roll on the Sludge Belcher was because he had to use the Dark Bomb to finish it off instead of the Mortal Coil. If that implosion had rolled four, the Dark Bomb would still be in hand right now to deal with this Justicar. Uh, Nasim just suddenly seeming like he is in a very bad spot. He's punching out that Leroy and... Uh. I'm a big fan of that play, actually. He recognizes that if he can stabilize here, the win condition of the 6-6s six every turn are going to get the job done. So he doesn't need that burst damage finish necessarily. He just needs to find an efficient way of keeping control on the board. And that was pretty solid. Yeah, here Amnesiac has a few options. Gorhau looking like the most obvious one to, to take no. care of the Infernal. He could also slam execute it and play something else. Maybe develop a minion with the death lord potentially, but just getting the weapon out right now. In combination with the Chrome, that would be enough if there was no Acidic Swamp boost. Right, we talked about last game how Amnesiac did not have the health to leverage that Gore Howl effectively. This turn or this game time around, he absolutely does. He has that tank up online, so he is ready to go and he can actually deal with a few of these uh, Dread Infernals from Nostum. Yeah, I mean, he can he can kind of delay the inevitable for a while, but he's he's really going to be needing to make the aggressive push at some point. He cannot stall this game out indefinitely against a board of 6-6s. Six His goal is going to be to make the aggressive play that kills his opponent with that Gromash Hellscreen, the slam as the activator in hand, plus in his mind that Gore Howl to stack up the damage. Nostum has to find the best defensive play possible that he can on every turn here, and eventually he's just going to run out of ways to do that. Yeah, Nostam is aware that there's no Inner Rage and no Cruel Taskmaster in Amnesiac's right. deck. So, so the best that Amnesiac could do is 10 damage from the hand. All right, this Acidic Swamp Ooze is going to do a lot of work in terms of protecting Nostam if he chooses to play it. Yeah, he's just deciding on his sequencing here. Obviously, if he's going to Demon Wrath this board, he wants to do it before the Acidic Swamp Ooze comes down. So he's just deciding whether he needs to deal with these 1-1s, decides that he does, and he's probably just going to get his hero power value here instead of using a heal bot. But as you said, oh, great recognition. Uh, okay, got it. <laughs> got it in time. But yeah, as you said, Savi, great recognition. He's left his opponent needing 11 damage, knowing that the maximum that's likely to come out here is 10. Right, Nasim displays some sick APM there, playing that Dark Peddler <laughs> down and getting the Worgen Infiltrator. Seemingly impossible uh, to do, but he manages to pull it off before the rope burns out on him. Yeah, it looked a little bit scary in the end there. In case that uh, the player is not fast enough to pick the minion, the player would end up with a random one. 
Looks like we're going to see a similar play to we saw in a, in the previous series involving this deck, where he's looking at sacrificing his own Death Lord here to get additional value out of his Brawl. Picks up the, as we've described, somewhat useless Kez and Mystic in this matchup, but no big deal. It's another minion that gets good, gets taken down with the Brawl, and he'll probably be looking to equip the Fiery War Axe at the end of this turn and snipe down whatever whatever's left. He does have the opportunity, though, to go aggressive as well and set up lethal with that Gromma. Yeah, the Kez are not too bad here, but would have been a disaster would have maybe been a Sun Fury Protector or Defender of Argus, because those are the type of cards that Nostam needs to pick up quickly. Yeah, looking like he's just going to put out that Doomsayer, which is such a heads-up play here. Yeah, pretty awesome. He knows right now that he is threatening lethal, so defensive plays on the board here have to be made. He's he's threatening 13, so there has there can't be a reaction to this Doomsayer. There has to be a defensive play from Nostan. So the heal bot comes down here, and then Amnesiac immediately doesn't have to deal with any of that nonsense. He just gets the board completely straight back to himself with the initiative again. Yeah, I'm trying to think of ways. If he just Chrome, Chrome slams and goes face for 13 here, what can Nostam do? The, the Reno Jackson was already pulled out and the Antique Heal but is played. Is there any way to heal out of the Bass range? Savits, I love it. I think you're right. I think that's actually the play here. Uh, have we seen, we have, maybe haven't seen Lotheb if he's even in that, this deck, but that doesn't even prevent the Bash from happening. So it's hard to see anything that stops that line winning the game next turn. But Amnesiac either doesn't see it or he's spotted something that we haven't that prevents it. Yeah, taking a little bit slower approach, but. Likely to still work out quite well. Here, Nostam really needs to remove that, and he knows it, so I think we're gonna see the Shadow Flame. Mm, zombie Chow coming out here. Uh, is it gonna be, oh, he's gonna power Overwhelming and Shadow Flame the Zombie Chow to keep the 6-6 six, six on the board. I actually like this a lot, it makes sense. Does give up a power Overwhelming, though, in doing this play, so is that necessarily something? He's obviously lost Leroy, right. so the main win condition of this deck is obviously very much diminished, but do you think it affects him too much to do this play this way? Uh, not really. I think with the Leroy gone, the, the core of the Power Overwhelming's usefulness is, is pretty much extinguished. So using it there to essentially get a 6-6 six, six on the board for free that wouldn't have been there if it had been forced to Shadow Flame it the other way makes a ton of sense. I think that's it. This is going to be it. This is going to be it. There's no defensive play in hand. All right, well, Amnesiac. We've the champion. Amnesiac is about to pull this out, and he is going to take the series 3-1 if he sees it. He absolutely sees it. Slams the Grom. Grom going to get in there with the Shield Maiden, and Amnesiac is going to be the America's Winter Champion. He has punched his ticket to the Hearthstone World Championship of BlizzCon later this year. Congratulations to Amnesiac. Guys, any quick thoughts? Phenomenal play from Amnesiac throughout the entire tournament. Definitely one of the, the strongest standout moments in, in all of this. All right, we're going to go ahead and toss it over to Dan. He is about to get the interview with our America's Winter Champion, Amnesiac. All right, congratulations, Amnesiac. Here's your trophy, man. Now that you've actually declared yourself the America's Champion, just go through what's going through your head right now. Talk to me. Uh, it's unreal. When I showed up in DC and in a 128-man bracket, I couldn't have possibly expected to have won it all. It, it just feels incredible. That's awesome, man. And now that you're officially the champion, do you have anything you want to say to everybody that's watching right now? As you, as a 15-year-old player that's been relatively new, but everyone's been talking about you, what do you want to say right here, right now? I really appreciate everyone who watched and supported me this whole weekend. It wouldn't have been possible without everyone who was helping me along the way. And with that, congratulations. I present to you the Hearthstone America's Champion for Winter 2016, Archon's Amnesiac. Thank you so much to everybody who has been able to watch. Remember to tune in this Friday at 2 p.m. Central Eastern European time for the European Winter Championships. Thank you all for Frodi and everyone here in Hollywood, California. Have a good night, and we'll see you guys next time.